could afford a room in a boarding house. They could afford clothes and shoes and medicine. They could afford food. So they actually had a pretty good gig, if you will. Um, so, and also they had plenty of clients because the cult of domesticity was driving the men out of the home and into their room. Now, there were no brothels. Brothels were not allowed, but there were boarding houses that allowed relations. So women would take a room in a boarding house. Uh, fine, refined women could not go into the pub. Hookers could. So, after you're done, you can go into the bar down below and you can meet somebody because you don't really care about your reputation being ruined because as far as the upper middle class is concerned, you don't have one. So it kind of put them in the middle of the action. Now, with the rise of hookers came the rise of venereal disease. With men going with prostitutes, they brought the venereal diseases home and gave it to their wives. <laughs> So it's sort of a vicious cycle. So here's the, this was the concept of the prostitute at the time. This is Rossetti's Found, in which a man goes and finds, I believe it's supposed to be his sister, uh, who has been uh, selling herself. And she looks you know, torn apart and just unhealthy. But in reality, they were quite OK. Because being a prostitute was much better than working in a uh, uh, a factory because it was a 14 hour work day, there was no pay, you couldn't afford food. And bringing us back to the corset and prostitutes, we have a fetish developing within the Victorian society. This is a black leather fetish corset with matching shoes. So men were obviously looking for a lot more than just a warm body. They wanted to be whipped harder and maybe ridden like a horse and made to feel like a dirty, dirty boy. Um, <laughs> or maybe not. I mean, this wasn't everybody's cup of tea. One of my favorite prostitution stories um, is the Cleveland Street Scandal. And this was Victorian England at its best. There was a male brothel on Cleveland Street in London and it was run by a 35-year-old 35 year gentleman who had pimps. And one of those pimps worked in the post office. And he recruited boys between the age of 15 and 18 to come work at the Cleveland Street House of Ill Repute. The boys were, by the way, allowed to marry at 14. So they were considered adults. Girls could marry at this age at 12, or in this era at 12. So the boys came and worked at the house. Um, what led to the uncovering of this house of ill repute was that there had been theft at the post office. One of the boys was searched, and on him, in cash, was more than a week's pay. So the director of the post office questioned him and accused him of stealing that money from the post office coffers, and the boy broke under the pressure and said that he had been paid this much money by this home for doing things with men. And that led to four other boys being uncovered that were to the post office. The whole house was shut down. And within the house was a client list. And this was the Heidi Fleiss of the 1880s. It involved magistrates, titled nobility, lawyers, doctors, everybody. And the list was never revealed to protect the privacy of the uh, accused because they could have been sued if they revealed who it was. But one of the people on the list was Queen Victoria's son, Prince Albert Victor. And Prince Albert Victor was also linked with the uh, Jack the Ripper murders, neither of which have ever been proved. Um, uh, it's complete you know, speculation, but it has sort of tainted his reputation throughout history. Um, so that's Cleveland Street. Since we're talking about brothels, um, Queen Victoria's grandson, yes, um, who would later become Edward VII, who was the father of Edward VIII, who was the husband of Wallace Simpson, and he abdicated the throne, and they became international superstars. Um, he had a huge sexual appetite. But he didn't practice it in England because he was afraid to get caught. So he went to France. 
and he had a favorite bordello that he went to because bordellos are legal in France. And at that bordello, he would, you know, get up to hijinks as you do. And he had a sex chair made, and he was a large man, and he wanted to make love to multiple women at one time, and he didn't want to crush them with his enormous girth. So he had a chair made, a reinforced Rococo Revival sex machine. And you can see that we've got a lovely ergonomic seat at the top with handrails that look like cross-country ski poles. And at the bottom, we've got another reclining upholstered seat. Notice the stirrups for the lady's comfort and the footrests for his own traction. I don't know if this thing was bolted to the floor because I could really see it was being pushed across the room like a squeaky chair. This is the original. It was very popular and copies were made. The original is in the possession of a private collector. Here's a diagram of how you do it. I'm still not sure how you use this bottom diving board, but I do know that this is a knee rest for setting your clock, perhaps. And I do like that in the diagram, because he is a noble, he kept, keeps his hat on because he's a gentleman. Um, she's kind of relaxed, quite frankly, but you can see, I don't understand the stirrups. But, uh, I mean, I understand them, but it just looks a little contorted. But anyway, so, Victorian sex chair. Now, if your husband has gone out with a hooker and given you gonorrhea, you might get uh, female hysteria. Here's a bride strangling a girl. Um, she's looking very upset. This is from uh, an image just from some Victorian, like, penny dreadful, like, drivel Jackie Collins books from the Victorian age. Um, female hysteria is a thing. Female hysteria was diagnosed as basically any sort of weird behavior you might see in your life. If your wife has a loss of sexual appetite, a loss of appetite appetite, if she seems depressed, if she seems excitable, if she seems sad, if she seems excessively happy, if she seems jittery, if she seems nervous, then she might have female hysteria. Because all the doctors were male, they thought that the cure for female hysteria was to give her the orgasm of her life. Now, if you ask a woman, when she's ticked off, when she's feeling vulnerable or sad or droopy or sick, she doesn't want you to touch her at all. She doesn't want to, you know, have a moment with you. She wants to feel bad and get over it and move on. But because Victorian male doctors had a very man-centric view on medicine, they didn't really understand women. They didn't really care to understand women. Um, they felt that women, their entire physiology, was predisposed to mental illness to begin with. So they thought all women were crazy or had the, <laughs> had the makings of crazy. And we had to nip this crazy in the bud. Um, what female hysteria actually was, and this is a modern review of it, female hysteria is believed to be postpartum depression. It's believed to be the feelings of, of, of overwhelming depression, the feelings of stress of having this world of responsibilities being put on you at a very young age, the feelings of stress from running a household, from keeping a husband, from raising children, from having a child die. Um, in this period, if you were to be a respectable woman, you were to get married. What if you didn't want to get married? What if you didn't want to have children? What if you weren't ready? A lot of psychological issues are much bigger than getting off. And that's what the real problem was. That's what caused depression in female hysteria. It wasn't the fact that they just needed an orgasm. And you know that I've got furniture for this. <laughs> So, the first treatment of female hysteria was a fire hose. <laughs> they would sit you in a chair in a hospital and shoot you with jets of water in your most sensitive place that might not like cold water coming at it. So, she doesn't seem to be that disturbed by it, but it's just an artist rendering. 
<laughs> so you <laughs> so you can get assaulted with a fire hose. <laughs> yeah. They found that, well, fire hoses might not be the best way. You might actually have to touch these people to make them feel better. So, well, anyway, here's what, what happened to you after female hysteria. You're usually put in a straight jacket and drugged and left in bed until you felt better. Um, so this is a female hysteria patient. Uh, it doesn't sound any better when it's written in French. Hysteria. <laughs> so they decided that they should you know, touch you and stimulate you in some way. So the first vibrator emerges in the 1750s, and it's basically a 1950s egg beater. <laughs> Crank operated, it comes with, this one comes with three attachments, loofah, golf ball, <laughs> when she gets laughing, I go, Move a golf ball and meet Tim Rebeiser. And it just... And you go to Tim. <laughs> then we invent this. It's the size of a dining room table. It's operated by a steam engine. That has to be kept in another room. <laughs> and loaded with coal, oh and through the middle comes a rotating spear. Wow. So you have to lay on a table, and this was for house calls. <laughs> now, doctors got tired of this because you have to put it on the cart, you have to get it through the door, you have to make sure they have coal, you have to bring someone to shovel the coal while you operate the table. So the table was sort of... <laughs> was put out faster. <coughs> so, women are encouraged to come in to the doctor, but they don't want to come into the doctor because then people will know that they have hysteria. So, quack mechanics come out with galloping machines because doctors recommend that if you can't make it into the office for your weekly visit that you either go out and ride a horse Ride in a carriage or vigorously sit in a rocking chair <laughs> to help you achieve orgasm. So this is a gas-powered mechanical horse that she is sitting on. Now because she's a lady, she's sitting side saddle. If she really wants to go to town, she should just straddle it. But these things start showing up in houses. Then there's this which is called, and I kid you not, the Chattanooga. <laughs> Sorry, I promised myself I wouldn't laugh because that takes away the, my professional allure. Um, the Chattanooga was an armature, again, steam powered in another room, there's a hole in the wall where these arms come through and the doctor stands there and sort of works you over with the arms of the Chattanooga. Uh, this was a two to three dollar procedure to have done. Now, <laughs> now we have the invention of the Pleasure Vibe 5000 that seems somewhat familiar today, although it does look like a Dremel. <laughs> the Pleasure Vibe 5000 comes in its own carrying case for modesty. The reason this was invented was because doctors were developing carpal tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> because some women were either desensitized or just old battle axes and it took up to an hour to treat them. <laughs> and so the doctors were losing money. <laughs> and so they had this. And as you can see, variety of attachments, a small hand mirror. <laughs> this was the fifth appliance in the American home to be electrified. 
to plug into a wall. <laughs> Toaster, refrigerator, vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> Hysteria. Not so funny. All right. <laughs> Take off my jacket. Um, all right, so next, I found, again, as I said, uh, the Victorian lifestyle would essentially kill you. So this is a cutaway of a typical middle class Victorian townhome. Victorian homes with the Industrial Revolution and the huge focus on moving into the city and expanding uh, meant that homes were being built very quickly, in some cases very shoddily. So this is a cross section of a home. You can see multi layers, multi staircases. One of the biggest killers in the home was the staircase. On the first and second floor where the public would be seen, the staircase was broad and grand and dramatic, but as you got further up into the house with the maid's quarters and the attic, the staircases got steeper and narrower. Many servants lost their footing, fell down the stairs and broke their necks because we didn't have building codes. We didn't have um, the understanding of how the human body works. So housemaids and, and uh, footmen were expected to climb narrow stairs. When you've got narrow stairs, you have to go up sideways. And it's very hard for you to get up into a space like this safely. So that element of the home was, was horribly tragic in a lot of ways. Within the Industrial Revolution and within this age, as I said, we had the, the quacks who were telling you what was good and bad. We also had a lot of uh, corruption within the food industry. So this is a, a picture postcard of a baker, but a lot of our bread, and bread was the number one um, product to be corrupted, a lot of our bread was being diluted, if you will, with plaster of Paris, with chalk, with alum. Um, and alum is a whitening agent used in detergents. And we would have alum and chalk, potato flour, bean flour, added into the, the bread at the mill, then the baker would add it, and then the, the actual bakery that sells the bread would have anything to do with it. But all of these uh, ingredients that weren't necessarily good for you were put into your food. And the issue with this is that in the Victorian age, and in the 1920s, in the 18th century, in the 17th century, you wanted white bread, because white flour was expensive. If you had white bread on your table, everybody would be impressed. Today, we like bread that is full of nuts and rocks and berries and weighs 20 pounds. That's what we want, is bread that will clean your clock. In this period, we wanted cake. We wanted like white, fluffy, beautiful bread that had no nutritional content at all. So by adding alum and chalk and plaster of Paris, we get white flour. And this allows the miller and the baker to use cheap flour. So they're making more money on their bread by putting in bad products. And Victorian housewives and maids were completely fooled. And eating chalk and plaster of Paris and alum leads to stomach issues, digestive issues, diarrhea, <coughs> chronic diarrhea. Um, I have other notes here, so pardon me while I read them, because we can't remember everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, milk at the time was treated with boric acid to remove the smell of spoiled milk and <coughs> prolong its shelf life, and it provided a breeding ground for bovine tuberculosis. And it's uh, estimated that half a million children die of bovine TB, and bovine TB affects bone growth and spinal formation. Other killers in the home included the toilet, the bathtub, <laughs> gas lights, and the laundry mangle, and let me tell you why. The toilet was still being perfected. We did not have that U-bend in the toilet. The purpose of the U-bend is to prevent gases from leaking back in from the sewer. The U-bend fills up with water, so that that acts almost like is a cork to keep the gas from coming through. <laughs> We didn't have this. We just had a big hole, and then you did your business, and you pulled the chain, and everything was cool. But it wasn't. Because we didn't have the U-bend, gases leaked back into the home. 
Homes are now being fitted with gas lighting. So when excess gas, methane gas, comes into contact with open flame, your toilet explodes. Bathtubs. Bathtubs are a luxury item. Everybody wants hot water at the bath. Now that we have an upper middle class in the Victorian age, we're able to get piped water into the bathroom instead of boiling water and carrying it upstairs. The shortcut to this is that they're going to put a furnace under the bathtub so that you turn on the furnace, fill it full of water, create a lovely hot bath, and get in. What they didn't tell people to do was to turn the furnace off before they got in. So people were boiled alive or severely burned. People also didn't tell uh, the consumer to fill it with water before they turned on the furnace. So when it fills with water, it immediately evaporates. Um, as you can see, they do have a towel warmer on the side, so that's a nice consolation. <laughs> but this is a, a gas bathtub. Plus the fact that you're sitting on a time bomb with gas underneath you. Um, the mangle was a new laundry device to save the housewife time because we didn't have dryers. Uh, you'd wash your clothes, then send it through a press. The issue with this is that it's on wheels. And also, this is a lovely place for little hands to go. So lots of children died accidentally in the manga. Um, they wouldn't get crushed completely, but the shock of it would kill them. And then we have gas lighting. Gas lighting is a wonderful new invention. At this age, we can now illuminate an entire room with gas. There are three kinds of gas, water gas, wood gas, and coal gas. At this time, gas companies are springing up left and right. Gas companies are highly unethical, and they are trying to sabotage the other companies by affecting their gas pressure. By reducing the gas pressure, they create gas leaks in the homes, and people are asphyxiated. As well, gas is not easy to regulate at this time. So if you light a lamp and there's too much gas coming in, you can blow up the entire room. If you walk into a room filled with gas, which at this time does not smell, walk into a room with a candle or a pre-lit gas lamp, you could blow the room up. People that were putting gas piping and also electricity and water into these new homes didn't know what they were doing. They just said that they did. So there was no regulation on the people that put it in. So all of these new advances were sort of set back by quacks that were putting them together. I mentioned this in the video. We had a uh, park scene invented at this time by an inventor named Alan Parks. And park scene was a precursor to celluloid, which is a precursor to plastic. With celluloid, park scene, and plastic, you could fake the appearance of uh, ivory. Uh, this new plastic was used as boning and corsets because it was cheaper than whalebone. It was used as mother of pearl buttons. It was used as collars and cuffs on men's clothing. Um, it was a wonderful product because it was cheap. What was bad about it was that it was highly combustible. As it grew older, it began to release gases and oils. And when it got close to a heat source, it would explode. So women's corsets would catch on fire. Men's, um, in this uh, cartoon, we have a man's uh, buttons blowing off of his coat because they were too close to fire. If they rubbed together, they would ignite. So this was not the best invention in the world after all. Um, another thing, and this is our last slide for, for this uh, part of my lecture. Um, another thing that people did, just carrying on into our you know, food and what we would do to it, the Victorians loved pretty, pretty food. They would eat anything. And in order to get pretty, pretty food, they would do anything to get it. They loved their jello molds, they loved their meats, they loved their desserts, they loved their pastries and all of that. So they would add horrible things to their food to make them look better. In addition to boric acid in your milk and plaster in your flour. <coughs> and of course, I can't remember that either because I'm still hung up on vibrators. And um, <laughs> let's see. They would add lead chromate to make mustard yellow so that they wouldn't have to put in more mustard. Lead chromate is what we use to paint school buses yellow. It is paint. Um, tea, which is still a status symbol and still quite expensive, tea is infused with iron filings, 
dust, used tea leaves, and black lead to make it black. And sawdust is added to mashed potatoes to add volume. Coffee is mixed with sand, ground beans, carrots, and burnt sugar to make coffee cheaper for the manufacturer. And candy is colored with lead to make the colors more vibrant. Uh, tallow, which is a pure fat, is added to butter to add more volume to the butter and reduce the cost for the dairy. And strychnine is added to beer to enhance flavor. For a little while, until you die of strychnine poisoning, and then in 1868, after all this and more, the first food safety legislation is introduced to regulate um, uh, the, the safety of food. But by that time, people don't know what food should taste like because it's been full of lead and strychnine and arsenic and all these other things. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention, speaking of arsenic, um, arsenic was used to create the color green. In the Victorian age, green was a huge color. The reason it was huge is because we could never produce green. Green is a combination of colors. If we try to use a natural pigment to create green, it always fades and turns yellow or brown. So with arsenic, we could create green. So we had green paint and green wallpaper and green fabric and green stationery. But we also had arsenic poisoning because you could ingest arsenic. So a lot of children got arsenic poisoning from eating or sucking on a piece of cloth or eating a piece of wallpaper. And as well, if particularly with arsenic wallpaper, because you have paste on the back of the wall, and if you're in a moist area, the paste creates a breeding ground for bacteria, which can become airborne and carry arsenic so you can breathe it in. Um, so it was not the best alternative. Um, the man who invented the arsenic color was Scheele, who was a um, Swedish chemist, S-H-E-E-L-E. -E. And at the time, they didn't know. But, interestingly enough, also, even when we did know about arsenic poisoning, and for all of his efforts towards a handmade lifestyle and a recollection of the good old days of the medieval era, William Morris owned an arsenic mine. And then he sold it after they found out he owned it. But he owned a big old arsenic mine. So, anyway, that's, that's my take on Victorian uh, psychoses. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.